30 seconds. I, I remember one time in a restaurant, you and I were having competitive pulse rate comparisons. <laughs> pulse rate right now. <laughs> oh, low. I feel, I feel happy. All right. All right, hello everyone. And welcome to The Human Factor, the LinkedIn Live of Inc. and Fast Company. I'm Eric Schoenberg, the CEO of Inc. and Fast Company. Is this the best boss in America? That was the headline on Inc. Magazine five years ago. It referred to our guest today, Dan Price, the founder and CEO of Gravity Payments in Seattle. Just this spring, Gravity Payments was recognized by Fast Company as a winner of its coveted World Changing Ideas Award. Now, what's so attractive about Gravity is a uniquely generous and controversial approach to payroll. Price instituted what is essentially a $70,000 a year minimum wage for employees. The move catapulted Price from the CEO of a small business in Seattle into both a media darling and sometimes a media punching bag, a status that has proven for Price to be both a little exhilarating and more than a little confronting. So, but let's hear about it from the man himself, Dan Price, founder and CEO of Gravity Payments. Dan, thank you for being here. It's great Eric, to see you again. It's so nice to see you. Thanks for having me again. Well, Dan, there are probably a few people in America, not many, but a few who don't know the back history of Dan Price. And so let's start at the beginning, like we would in an a Inc. or Fast Company feature story. Where'd you grow up? And what did that have to do with the way you eventually came to run Gravity Payments? Well, I'm the fourth of six kids. I grew up in rural Idaho. Um, but the reality is, I and this is something that I've come to realize, I think, just recently, I'm not sure it had a whole lot to do with how I ran gravity payments. Because I think, you know, previously, when I would speak to journalists, and they would ask me that question, I would answer it and just share everything. But I realized that too much of the story was becoming about me when the reality is I was faced with a situation where I started the company to stick up for everyday people, for small business owners originally. And, you know, when you have a situation where, you know, people at the top are not only becoming wealthy, not only really paying taxes, not only getting bailouts from government whenever they want to, people at the bottom are being blamed and, and, and you know, people are using tropes like avocado toast to, to blame everyday people uh, for their own financial woes, which the reality is it's the system and the structure. And so I don't think it took any kind of a genius or somebody with my background to recognize how awful things were and how wrong that was and change it. So I think I've you know, gotten way too much credit with all that. And I think the reality is that any third grader with any kind of sense of a third grade morality and intelligence would have done what I did. And I think the fact that people are still interested in talking about it five years later just shows people that, you know, the system is that bad and the level of propaganda and conformity that serves the wealthy, the people at the top is so bad that, you know, these examples, which are should be banal, are so intriguing for people. Wow. Now that was a mouthful, Dan. I, uh, I think we got to get back to avocado toast. <laughs> but first, uh, I, I want to go back to what you said right at the beginning of, of the founding of Gravity Payments. You just did it to help small businesses. Uh, elaborate on that. So I grew up playing rock music. You know, people make, you know, people laugh when they see the way I look, of course. And, uh, you know, that explains maybe a little bit of it. But I was playing rock music and we needed to raise some money for a tour. So we started playing acoustic cover shows at night at this coffee shop. And the coffee shop owner, it's Moxie Java, Java Caldwell in Caldwell, Idaho, a tiny town in Caldwell, about an hour from Boise. The owner at the time, Heather Hempel, was explaining to me how she had to dock her pay, our pay because her credit card provider and her bank was just raking her over the coals just to get paid on a credit card. And I was 17 at the time. I was a junior in high school. And I said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I don't mind kind of negotiating and sticking up to bullies. Like that seems like a good idea. So I renegotiated her credit card processing fees for her. 
she told friends about me and I started doing that for other businesses. And so it was just, you know, using my somewhat uh, sometimes seen as abrasive personality for good instead of evil by complaining to these credit card companies. And the whole idea of the business was just to try to look at this unfair system that was hurt, hurting a small business owner like Heather that was doing everything for her community, getting very little in return, probably making less per hour than any of her employees were making, just trying to make that slightly less bad was really you know, my ambition in life at that time and still the most important thing I do today. So the, uh, this, this original company that you founded basically negotiated rates with credit payment companies on behalf of small businesses. And then you went into the business yourself of processing the payments. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to overstate it. Like it wasn't really a company, it was just a kid. <laughs> it was a 17 year old kid. And then when I was a freshman uh, at Seattle Pacific University, I was there studying music and I ultimately ended up getting my degree in music. But as a freshman, you know, I just decided that these big companies were impossible to hold accountable because they would come up with so many hidden fees, so many ways to kind of mistreat Heather. And I think to make it something a little bit more tangible for the audience, like think of all the big companies that just tell you, this is just the way it is. And you can't really call anybody that is a decision maker or has any kind of power to complain about it. This is just the way it is. You're gonna pay this hidden fee or we're gonna change the terms or we're not gonna support you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. We all face that every day in life. And that's what Heather was facing from this industry. And I learned that if I wanted to have a lasting impact and make things not quite so bad in terms of the disadvantage that Heather, who's a small business owner, was facing just to take a credit card, I had to start to build my own technology to have any hope of reversing that. So it was Heather Hempel telling you about her problems that led to the birth of Gravity Payments. It was another epiphany with another woman, an employee this time, that led to the epiphany that led to the $70,000 minimum salary at Gravity. Tell us that story. Yeah, so uh, Rosita Barlow, she was working at McDonald's but hiding it from her boss, me, because she thought she would be fired for moonlighting. And she made the unfortunate, in her mind, mistake of leading, leaving her McDonald's training manual on her desk for me to find. And when she called, when I called her into my office, she told me later that she thought it was to get fired. So she was coming mm. into my office mm. thinking she was going to get fired. And she had sacrificed so much to work at Gravity Payments. And I can tell you, Eric, this is the part that I think people really need to understand she was just as important, if not more important to the success of Gravity Payments than I was. And here I am, you know, becoming a, a millionaire and she has to moonlight and work at McDonald's to be able to afford to work at my company. And so seeing that with Rosita and then also a friend of mine who did not work at Gravity, who worked at a spa, Valerie Molina, on a hike with her where she had a $200 rent increase that sent her life into chaos. She was telling me how hard it is to live in Seattle off $40,000 a year. And then I kind of put these things together and I could, it, it was just so obvious. Even somebody that maybe was a bit out of touch the way I was, it was so obvious that I could not miss the fact that these were the people that were creating the value, but the system had been engineered for them to not get the value. And so Rosita still works at the company today. In fact, her and I were able to go on the Kelly Clarkson show together last year, which was a really special, wonderful bonding moment for the two of us and tell you know the American audience that story with Kelly Clarkson just being so excited about it. Um, but it's those things where it's like, it, it, it's just so obvious that it knocked me over the head. This has to change. We have to do something about it. Why 70,000, why that? particular number? Well, I, I, the answer is a little embarrassing. So I had remembered Angus Deaton and Daniel Kahneman's uh, Princeton study about how there was a certain amount of money that once you made that amount of money, your well-being would not be harmed by lack of money. And I felt like that was the standard that every company should aspire to achieve or to the extent they can achieve it, even if it takes risk and sacrifice from shareholders and executives. At this point, 
it's a moral imperative. Like this, this is so obvious that if you're not doing this, like you're literally doing it wrong. And I would say that to Jeff Bezos or anybody else, but their number was actually 75,000. So I misremembered it. <laughs> and, and I was talking to friends and family and saying, Hey, how much would you need to make to be able to just live a life and be healthy? I'm not saying wealthy. I'm saying healthy. Mm. And, and, and I think, I, I looked at it wrong. Employers look at this wrong. If you're not paying that amount and you all of a sudden pay that amount, it's not like you're doing that person any favors. I really don't deserve the kind of credit I've gotten. If you're paying less than that amount, your compensation structure that you designed as a boss, as an entrepreneur, as a shareholder is actively hurting and making not less wealthy, but less healthy, hurting the well-being of the people that are working there. And that's a tough message, especially to small businesses that can't afford to do it. But I think just being honest about that and working on the problem together, having these conversations, it's a moral imperative that we do it. And the big companies that can afford to do it, shame on them because, you know, just to just to line the pockets of wealthy people with more money, they are literally hurting the 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 welfare, the well-being of tens of thousands of, of real people. Uh, getting uh, uh, up to a point where the minimum wage at your company is $70,000 is, uh, is a big bite for a lot of small companies. How did it work at Gravity? How many people ended up with raises, for example? Well, the story there was more complicated than what people grasp, just because in our information age and social media, like, you know, you have those bite sizes. So everyone heard the headline $70,000 per year. But mm -hmm. the reality of it was that we immediately took people from 35,000 a year to 50, which took my million dollar pay cut that used up that whole million dollar pay cut. Then we had $2 million in profit that would go towards savings and paying down debt and paying taxes and those sorts of things. And the, the rest of it from 50 to 70 would take $3 million. So we took it on as a mission as a company to figure out how to become more efficient, work together well, instead of tearing each other down and competing with each other, how do we support each other? Because we all have this team goal. And so the sixty and the seventy thousand dollars, which happened a year after the announcement and two years after the announcement, those ones were ones that really our team created. I might have announced it and got a lot of credit for it, but I got way too much credit. The team created it, so we scaled up together. And that's a system. That's a formula that could be implemented by any business. Let's set a goal of what does it take for everybody here to not be harmed by lack of money. And let's try to find some way to work on that together without taking away from our mission of providing a great value and great trust to small businesses when they need to accept a credit card. The obvious response of many CEOs is that, uh, you know, I could never afford to do that. The business would suffer. Uh, I would upset my higher paid employees uh, and my profit margin would disappear. What really happened to Gravity Payments? Well, just say to that also, a lot of companies out there, big companies, they can afford to do it. They're choosing not to do it. And their excuses, they say, well, you can't violate the capitalistic law of paying people the least amount possible or there will be negative consequences, mm. which just pure BS. But what happened at Gravity Payments is we came together. You know, people show up to work so motivated their first day, so excited, wanting to do the right thing. And then they see the leaders of the company, and in some cases, myself included, and their company violate every reasonable standard when it comes to ethics and morals. And what does that do to their motivation? What does that do to their sense of being engaged? And that's why the Gallup organization will tell you that like only 34 or 40% of employees actually want their company to succeed. And in fact, 10% of employees, one out of 10 of your employees, if you're a small business owner or any business out there, would actually rather your company fail than do neutrally. And so you can imagine the lost productivity, plus you have turnover, you have all these very tangible costs that go with it. So if you create a better system, a better structure that's more holistically healthy, 
the way that we're working toward doing together, you eliminate all those costs. And so over the past five and a half years since we've implemented this, we went from having between zero and two babies born per year at the company to we've had 55 born or announced in the last five years. We've had a 10X in people buying a home for the first time, which is so important for your financial security, not to let housing prices like over the last few months, housing prices have gone up by 15%. Imagine if you're struggling to make ends meet and your housing prices rise by 15%. So people are getting out of that. We also had 70% of the company report that they pay down debt. And we had between a doubling and a tripling in terms of retirement savings. But in terms of the company, our employee attrition was cut in half. And we are now processing three times as many dollars for small businesses as we were five and a half years ago. And we're doing it for a lower cost than we ever have before in our history to those small businesses. Um, and you've also just recently bought a company in Boise. So expanded gravity payments beyond Seattle. Yeah. So a local paper in Boise that I grew up reading, the Idaho Statesman did a quick little story on gravity and me and the success we were seeing. And this was prior to the $70,000 minimum wage. So this was, you know, back at a period where I was able to enjoy a little more obscurity than I'm able to now. But there was a CEO that printed it off, cut it up put it on his bulletin board and sat on it for four or five years. And then he called me and he said, Dan, my doctor is telling me if I don't retire, I'm, I'm like going to be in trouble. Like I need to get out of this and I need somebody to take over my legacy. I need somebody to take over this company. But it was a company that would, had been kind of run with an iron fist the way kind of most people fra fairly were trained to run a company. And so his lowest paid employees and even his median pay was under $30,000 a year. Median, mm. that's middle paid employee was making less than $30,000 a year. So what did we do? Even though people said it's Idaho, the cost of living's lower, we are scaling up in the same or similar pattern to $70,000 and we immediately put everyone in $50,000 in Idaho. And the beautiful thing about that is, $70,000 a year in Idaho, you can raise a family of four or five with one income. And I feel like that's such a huge part of the American dream. That's a, such a huge part of the fabric of the history of this country and like the good of it. So if we can allow more and more people, regardless of their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their religion, anything else, to be able to connect to that dream in Seattle, in Idaho, or anywhere else, that's really, I think, the essence of what good work should be. Let me get back to just the practical nature of this. What happens with the people who were already making more than the minimum wage? Uh, are, are they disgruntled uh, or do they get raises too? How does that work? The vast majority said, I feel now at ease. Because before I was stressed thinking about my coworker and how they were doing, and you've taken that stress away from me. And this person that is so valuable to what I'm doing, because we work together, we collaborate. I mean, I've been in your office, Eric. I know you collaborate with everybody at your company, depending on what the situation calls for. And I know you develop a genuine relationship and a genuine care for every single person. And I, your viewers are all the same. We all share that in common. And so all of a sudden knowing that that person that you're really enjoying collaborating with, that's helping bring out the best in you as the CEO of two really wonderful, powerful media organizations, like you want that person to be okay. So I heard from my people that were at 70 or above, vast majority was like, that took off stress. Now. I did acknowledge the unfairness of it because in an ideal world, you'd take that person that was already at 70 or 80 and give them a bit of a bump too. And the reality was we couldn't quite afford to do that. And so that was a project that we had to say, how do we create better systems and structures to help people grow, be it here or if they decide to move on somewhere else? And that became a mandate of dealing with those things. We did though, I have to say, so people don't feel like I'm leaving something out, we did have two employees very publicly leave and they were valued employees that I care about and still friends with and care about to this day and say that they thought it was wrong and it was unfair. 
And I think their criticisms were warranted, but I think the idea of holding down 60 or 70 or 80 people because two or three people will be offended, just that's not a smart mm -hmm. business decision. The, the effect on the company of, of the change you made in the salary structure has been beneficial, as you just outlined. But the company is not immune from things that happen in the larger economy and gravity payments revenue is highly leveraged to business that's done at restaurants and other places that swipe credit cards. How have you done during the pandemic and how has the salary structure, the minimum wage held up? Well, let me set the stage for that one a little bit because in February of 2020, I was on a ski vacation with my family the BBC had written a story about us that had gone mega viral in Europe. So I was getting all sorts of kudos and plaudits. And I was about to release my book, Worth It, on April 13th, which was gonna be the five-year anniversary of the announcement of the $70,000 minimum wage. And I'll tell you, Eric, as somebody that I've known for a while now, it was the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. And I had no idea what was about to come, which was, brutal and painful. And I laugh not because it's funny, but because I think I'm still suffering from a little bit of PTSD, but we lost 55% of our revenue. Not only that, I was bawling my eyes out because these small businesses that had trusted gravity payments and trusted me and had really given me everything that I have in life, I was seeing them suffer and close and feel like they had no other option but to lay off their entire staff and still, you know, work around the clock and still think that they probably weren't going to make it. And in many cases being right. So it was brutal. It was devastating. I was shedding tears every day, but I also knew I had a responsibility to the 20,000 small businesses that we serve to try to come up with technology apps to help them with social distancing, with hygiene, all those things. And I also knew that if we went under in a pandemic to disrupt the income and the healthcare of the 200 employees that work at Gravity in a country that has such a low so, uh, social safety net, where you don't have guaranteed healthcare, where you could go bankrupt for the rest of your life for one of these two reasons, and it was just really hard. So I did something that's one of the hardest things I've ever done, which was I basically just laid that out over Zoom because we had closed our office for all 200 employees. And it seemed like we only had three options, raise prices on small businesses at the worst time, lay off employees at the worst time, or go out of business and the small businesses and employees would all suffer the, those consequences because we'd be gone. But our employees, again, were the heroes. And, and again, it was not me. I, I give myself credit that at least I was honest, but they came up with the idea, let's during the pandemic, have everybody determine their own pay anonymously. We'll have a spreadsheet so we can see what everyone's picked, but we won't know any names. Hmm. And hmm. they said, and I, I heard this, I'm like, that's never happened in human history. It won't work. Everyone will think, oh, I can give two or 3%, but somebody else is gonna be able to give more, let them rely on it. And we needed to get to a 30% reduction in our cost to, to have a chance of making it out. And our employees volunteered 35% average on pay cuts. 10 said they'd work for free. 30 said they'd work for half the price. And this was in an environment where the employees emphasized it has to be anonymous, so there's no pressure. And by doing that in March, April, and May, our employees were able to keep us in business for three months, which is amazing. But what they really did that was unbelievable is all of a sudden they built an app where coffee shops can you know, let people order ahead and bring out the coffee to your car so they can stay open. Restaurants can have order ahead. We're, we were all raising awareness about you know, how with restaurants, don't order from Uber Eats, don't order from DoorDash because they take such a big cut. With veterinarians, we were saying, okay, let's text out the invoice to the car so that the practitioner can bring the animal in and out from the car with everybody masks. Anyway, I could go on for literally days talking about all the solutions that our employees came up with. And we had 10 years of innovation packed into three or four months. And since then, we've been able to recover 90% of our revenue. 
restore everybody's pay and pay everybody back for the big risk and the big sacrifice they made. Now, our Grand Slam home run this year is not making a ton of money. It's going from going to be out of business and all need to look for new jobs to we can keep this together for a while. But we're feeling phenomenally uh, great about that. And the number one thing we're thinking about is what are the next eight or so months going to look like? Because eight months ago, I said the next 16 months, we could do more to help small businesses, which is what we're really about than we have in our last 16 years since we started the company. And so what are the next eight months going to look like? And how can we keep these small businesses from going under permanently and losing them forever? Um, how many users do those apps, you know, the, the small business apps that Gravity created, how many users do you have? I mean, they've been spread out across our 20,000 small business clients. And we've added more clients since the pandemic started than at any point in our history. Now, of course, the economy is depressed. So the amount of revenue that we achieve per client is a lot lower than it used to be. And that's OK. That's that's fine with us. But I don't know like the exact number off the top of my head. But I'll tell you, the adoption has been higher than it's ever been in our history by far. Um, with the uh, employees who are paid more than seventy thousand, and and as you said, we're happy to share some of the company's success with their lower paid employees. Philosophically, uh, it it seems like you have kind of two things going on at once. There's the there are the people who need to have uh, this minimum wage so that they uh, achieve acceptable levels of health and and life satisfaction, and then there are people who are higher paid than that, who are basically have a wage that's determined by the labor market. Is that a fair justification of how it works? And philosophically, isn't that kind of internally contradictory? Uh, you're close. That's how I thought it should work five and a half years ago. Uh -huh. But I realized that doesn't work. <laughs> and it's even more contradictory than you're saying. <clears throat> Our pay scale before, which is tethered to our competitors in our industry, went from $30,000 at the bottom to a million dollars a year at the top. And I could have deniability the way so many other companies do because like, well, this is the only way that everyone does it. So therefore, this is the only way you can do it. And I was guilty of believing that and saying it. Now our pay scale goes from $70,000 to $275,000. And the woman who's the chief operating officer at Gravity, who is in terms of top leaders, both the top paid, but also the most important leader at the company, she took over a million dollar pay cut to move from Silicon Valley, move her family to Seattle to work at Gravity. And so her market rate out there, because of her skill set, because of what she can do, you know, counting all the various forms of compensation, her market rate would be in the millions of dollars per year. And we have a lot of people at Gravity like that. In fact, I would say if you're in the upper half of the pay at Gravity, you can leave and walk down the street and get a big pay raise. And I don't try to keep that a secret because I want to be honest to people. So I think that the people at Gravity who are choosing to stay are understanding that they're sacrificing for what we're doing. And different than five and a half years ago, I believe that not only do we need to raise up the people who aren't making enough, but we need to get the wealth inequality, the income inequality under control. And so the people at the top need to make less. And that's an important component of it. And so, you know, that mostly applies to like billionaires, I think. But we at Gravity have to walk that walk. So if we don't have major skin in the game, then we're not going to have the kind of influence over that that we want to. Plus, just from a practical affordability standpoint, we really couldn't afford to do it, at least right now. So, you know, we've talked about, oh, let's try to get that 275 up to four or $500,000. That would be wonderful. But not before we get the 70000 up to $100,000. And so these things have to grow in lockstep. The idea that you can keep paying the people on top more and more and more 
and keep the people at the bottom the same and expect to not have problems. It doesn't work at a company level, but I think what we're finding out, unfortunately, through this pandemic especially, is it also doesn't work at a societal level, and it is starting to tear apart the fabric of our democracy and our society and our way of life. Is there any company that should not do this? I would. Uh, I would. I had originally written the question as. Uh, should every company do what Gravity Payments has done? But I think you've already answered that. But are there companies for whom this is just impractical and you wouldn't recommend it? Every company out there should have a path to a living wage. Now, um, one of the things, you know, it's a company that I would criticize also, but like one of my friends owns like 200 Jack in the Box. And so he's got a lot of low wage workers. But I talked to him over two or three years. He was talking to the executives, the powers that be there in Jack in the Box. And I don't know if I had any influence over it because of course they're not gonna tell me and I don't care. They implemented a program where there is some upward mobility to being able to make 50, 60, 70, $100,000 managing a Jack in the Box. I also told him, hey, if you can't get Jack in the Box to do that, you should have a pathway for people to get out of your company and show them a pathway to get into companies where they can. The important thing is not the company, the important thing is the people. And we're getting that so backwards, bailing out big corporations, bailing out the airlines when they took all the money and did it stock buybacks just to prop up executive pay and share price. We need to take care of people and see the people and not just think the companies, we hold the companies accountable, the people we give a hand up to. So almost every company, can set a target and say, everyone here should make a living wage. Companies like Amazon and Disney, it's completely inexcusable when you look at the enormous wealth that they've created for very few people. But even like a small business, if you're sure that you'll never have a business model that will allow somebody to make a wage where their well-being is not being harmed by how much they make, then give them a pathway out of the company to work at other companies. If you value your people and you want them to stick around, then you need to pay them a living wage 100%. It's not surprising that listening to you talk that you have sparked all kinds of vitriol from certain, uh, certain sectors of the economy and certain sectors of the media world. Um, Rush Limbaugh, for example, called you either a socialist or a communist or both. I forget which. Um, and you probably wear that as a badge of honor. <laughs> but but um, an another charge that has come up in the many profiles written about you is that that this is a publicity stunt. And it is true that when you made the announcement about the $70,000 floor at your company, you invited NBC News and and the New York Times to cover it. Why did you do that? Well, it's it's a little bit like the thing that we're doing currently in our society of not focusing on the important thing that's affecting our lives every single day, which is having less inequality. That would be great for the economy and great for everybody. And instead trying to find something to kind of pick at and intrigue us and get us to go off subject and off message. And of course, we're all kind of part of that, but it's no secret that personal intrigue and mystery and all these things are captivating. And I think, I think that in some ways, the powers that be know that. Like if you read Dark Money by Jane Mayer, I mean, she masterfully points out how Frank Luntz figures out all of the things that he can get us talking about so that we stay divided and fighting amongst each other and criticizing each other and we say stay off topic. So I was actually on your stage, Eric, not too long ago and a woman raised her hand and said, I heard you speak. And when I heard you speak, I decided to double the pay of all my lowest paid employees. And one of those employees reached out to me and said, Dan, before my boss heard you speak, I had rats running around. I was living in a basement. The plumbing didn't work. Now I have a two bedroom apartment, a boyfriend. I have dignity. I have independence. I can make my own choices. I don't need to be dependent on somebody else. 
those things inspire me to keep going. And to be honest, the way that we like externally in our society deal with these disagreements and these narratives and start fighting each other, it's a genuine turnoff for me. It's like really like not an enjoyable experience to go out and put myself in the middle of that equation. But how could I not do it? when I hear from people like Megan Driscoll at your conference telling me that story. And so I get messages ranging from that to, hey Dan, I read your book, Worth It, and I decided to quit my job because the company I'm working for is immoral and I can't do it anymore. And everything in between, I get those messages every day and that's what keeps me fighting for it every day. It's not so much that I need to be a part of it, I just feel like this work needs to be done and as much as I'm a very imperfect messenger, if I'm doing more good and every day trying to do less harm, then I'm gonna keep working. Well, I'd like to dig a little deeper into the cost of fame since you, as you brought it up. You obviously is a tool that you can use to spread your message around and get people like Megan Driscoll to change their, the way they do their, their business and do their payroll but it carries a cost. And I think about, there was a story about you, a big feature story in Esquire, not long after the ink story, in which the portrait that was painted of you was not flattering and it must have been very painful. Uh, and it raised the question uh, of whether you were in your private life as saintly as you appeared to be in your public life. How do you, how do you manage that? And do you regret that you allowed yourself to be so high profile? Well, the, the gentleman that wrote that story, his name's Stephen Roderick. And I know it's normal, like criticize journalists that write things that are unflattering about you. But Stephen's a fantastic writer and he's really good at what he does. And he's not trying to like throw a pitch down the center of the strike zone. He's trying to go through the dark alleyways and the untold stories and find the interesting and intriguing and in some ways hypocritical or contradictory parts of our lives and share that. And for me, subjecting myself to that type of, of journalism, I mean, if you read his stories, like he has a, a certain tone that he has in his portraits that's very consistent. Subjecting myself to that type of scrutiny and journalism was actually a, a more of a freeing thing than you might expect and more of a good thing that you might expect because I really am not as great as I'm portrayed. I agree with those criticisms and I don't think I should be a hero. I don't think I should held up, be held up to be a hero. Now, now, some of the most exaggerated or extreme things that are said about me like are completely untrue, but the reality is I'm not some perfect hero that's gonna save the world. And I think that when the media or anybody else puts me up as that, it has a danger of making people think that we're gonna have some savior, be it Donald Trump or Anthony Fauci or Barack Obama. And you see with some of these people may be wonderful and admirable much more than I am and maybe some less, but what doesn't change the system, the structure, that's gonna have to be on the issues, on the people, right? And so I think that in doing that profile, you know, people said, well, that's bad for your career, but it was a good thing in terms of being freeing. And while I disagreed with maybe some parts more and agreed with other parts more, it was Steven's perspective. It was him sharing his gift of being a, a really amazing writer that has a certain style and it gave me the opportunity, uh, again, whether or not I agree with it, to be a real human being and not a savior. And I think that was kind of the angle that Esquire took with that. And as much as it was painful, it was more relieving and freeing than anything else because all of a sudden I didn't have to be this perfect person for the rest of my life. Uh, well, Dan, that is an incredibly charitable response to that story. <laughs> That's kind of amazing. Uh, it still, uh, you you apparently have clearly have come to terms with it, but it must have stung to read things like there was a quote um, uh, attributed to you saying, uh, I'm a narcissist like all millennials. Uh, raises the question for someone who has known you for a long time is 
what do you think? Which is the real Dan? Is it the narcissist? Is it the crusader? Uh, okay. Steven lived with me for like three weeks. <laughs> so if you take three weeks of two funny guys bantering, you're going to get some off color quotes. You just are. And keep in mind, Steven's like last three uh, portraits really that he had written. Uh, you know, we say profile, they're really more portraits mm -hmm. had like Leonardo DiCaprio and Ringo Starr. And he's got a famous one about Johnny Depp. Like, this guy's got better stories <laughs> than almost <laughs> anybody I've ever met. And he is living with me for three weeks telling me all these stories. And so, you know, we're joking. We have banter. Like, so that the, the, the real Dan that you know, Eric, is a Dan that's willing to make fun of himself, willing to not take himself too seriously. And so, like, I mean, it's just undeniable with the age of social media and everything that we're subjected to. Think of everything that we subject ourselves to in these days, that we have to work through some of these issues and having some humor and lightheartedness is a good thing. Now, I know that there are real genuine things to be angry about. And I know that in standing up to injustice, standing up to bullies, like those are all things that I agree with. And I'm, like I say, like I'm, I'm willing and capable of taking criticism and scrutiny. You know, I've been subjected internally at Gravity to probably like a thousand anonymous reviews over the past 17 years from employees. And I, I, I really value that kind of criticism. But also, you know, I'm sitting there with him at my house and, you know, we're drinking some wine or whatever. And, you know, or we were at a, a stadium watching... Lionel Messi, you know, just thrill us with his, you know, majesty on the soccer field. And, you know, I, I think that the real Dan uh, has been at times loose lipped, willing to spill, willing to have fun when he should be more focused on doing his job. He should be more focused on understanding how things actually are. And I think that's an evolution that has not been completed by any means that I'm working on every day. But the reality is too, I want to be able to have a, a real life. I don't want my whole life to be performative. I really don't want any of my life to be performative. So it doesn't feel good. So do I want to be able to joke around and, and, and be off guard and, and maybe even if it's a way that doesn't hurt anybody you know, maybe be seen as like a little bit off color here and there. Like, I don't like any of those things, but I'm not willing to turn into a robot to prevent that from happening, especially when you have such a skilled journalist and storyteller with such a specific mandate on the other side of it. Uh, well, Leonardo DiCaprio and Johnny Depp, it's good company to be in, I think, in terms of uh, getting a profile written about you. Is looking back on all of this, is there from, you know, from the moment you first told Heather that you would stand up for her to, you know, the, the, the moment that your uh, employees volunteered to take that pay cut, is there anything that you wish you had done differently? Absolutely. I wish I would have called out the, the hypocrisy of people on top, the wealthy people, the people that I was really a part of and solidifying from the beginning. I wish I would have come to those realizations much earlier. And I wish I would have when journalists would ask me questions about me and my life and my background. I wish I would have been more skilled in answering the question quickly and diverting to what the real issue is here. Because just the way I was raised and without having like training or experience, I kind of thought of the way it worked is if somebody asks you a question, you give them the most generous answer you can in terms, generous in terms of you answer the question fully. But the problem with doing that, and I think anybody that's going to be out in the media needs to understand this going in is that gives the narrative to you. And I don't want to give the narrative to me. I want the narrative to be about the issues that we're talking about, about this, these solutions that we are proving everyday work. And so, you know, similarly to how I did at the beginning of this interview, trying to pivot those questions, I'm just gonna be straight with you because as I always am, and you and I have always had that kind of relationship. Like I 
I think that I, through no intention, ended up talking way too much about myself and making all this way too much about me. And I needed to have the skill to pivot and really help people to be able to see that it's not about me. It's really about these issues. And if you want to give credit or have somebody be a hero in this equation, look at the 200 employees at Gravity Payments. Look at the 20,000 small businesses we support. There's a lot of heroism there. Don't look at the guy who's 36, who's been a millionaire since he was in his 20s, who started a business and basically had everybody, you know, be so generous and give me so much. That's not a hero. That's somebody who is a beneficiary. The heroes are the people on the other side. And I think I just needed to recognize that I would be portrayed in a way that would not be true to who I am if I just answered the questions all the time straight, just how they were asked. Uh, that sounds like really good media training advice. And uh, I would say that you've pretty much mastered it. Uh, I'm going to go back to the one question that has been hanging since the very beginning of our conversation. What does avocado toast have to do with any of this? Well, we say that the reason why millennials or young people can't buy houses is because they like avocado toast and they're willing to pay $8 for it. And they're willing to pay $4 for a cup of coffee. And that is completely BS. The reality is that Four generations ago, 80% exceeded their parents. Three generations ago, 70% exceeded their parents. Two generations ago, 60% exceeded their parents. One generation ago, 50% exceeded their parents. Now you have a 40% chance of doing better than your parents did in terms of taking care of yourself and your family. That Those are the issues that are real, it's systemic. And there's this debate in this country between liberals and conservatives, between individual responsibility versus you know uh, what's seen as kind of handouts. And it completely misses the point. The system and the statistics and the evidence are undeniable. And when we point to these things like, well, what if Dan Price isn't so good like he seems, or how come you bought avocado toast or had a cup of coffee for $4? Those are not the real issue. The issue is that we are being robbed blind by the people on top and they are dividing us and keeping us fighting with each other. So if somebody wants to buy avocado toast, they should be able to buy $8 avocado toast and still be able to raise a family. Dan, those are fighting words, and that's a good place to end this. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thanks for answering all these questions, and, and thanks for what you've done with Gravity Payments. It's an it's a example to us all. So Eric, please. it really means a lot that you had me here, so thank you. All right, and thank you all for listening. Uh, this has been The Human Factor, the LinkedIn Live of Inc. and Fast Company. Thanks for watching.